Break Fix Podcast is all about capturing the living history of people from all over the autosphere, from wrench turners and racers to artists, authors, designers, and everything in between. Our goal is to inspire a new generation of petrol heads that wonder, how did they get that job or become that person? The road to success is paved by all of us because everyone has a story. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Break Fix. Our guest tonight is going to be Rob Holland, who is a former pro cyclist who became the revelation of the Speed World Challenge in the early 2000s. In 2012, Rob rebounded from the late demise of the Volvo factory C30 touring car program to become the first African-American in almost 40 years to race in the British Touring Car Championship. When Rob isn't racing, he spends his time at tracks around the world, working as a personal driving instructor, as well as other things for groups like Lamborghini, Audi Club of America, and 3Z3 Motorsports. Rob is currently the managing partner of Rotec Racing, which is based at the legendary Nürburgring, and is also known for his grocery getter series on Jalopnik. He does technical riding in grassroots motorsports and race reporting on speedtv.com. Currently, you can find him racing SRO World Challenge powered by AWS in the GT America series driving the Ford Mustang GT4 as the only American car in the paddock. That's right, folks. And joining me tonight as my co-host is David L. Middleton from My Racing, who you might recall from a previous episode of Break Fix. He also just so happens to be a personal friend of Rob's, where they met at the Nürburgring. So join me in welcoming Rob Holland from Rotec Racing to the show to tell us all about his unique motorsports journey. So welcome to the show, David and Rob. Hey, how's it going, guys? So let's get into it. Let's start at the top. How do you go from cycling to cars? Was there always a passion there? Were you always interested in motorsports starting as a child like David's story is? Or where did that passion come from? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, that's probably one of the first questions I get all the time is, is how did I make that transition? And for me, I just like racing. It doesn't make a difference what it is, whether I'm racing bikes or cars or, you know, shopping carts in the middle of the parking lot. You know, you put me in something, I'm going to race you. So that's kind of the genesis of it. But the specifics of it is that I left the cycling world because I unfortunately came up during the 90s, which was the Lance Armstrong era, and everybody kind of knows that story. And for me, uh, the drugs and the sports just, just weren't me. And I was an okay professional cyclist, but I was never going to win the Tour de France. I was never going to be this massive superstar. And so the combination of having to put stuff in my body that I really didn't want to, and the fact that I wasn't particularly good, led me to look at some other stuff. And so when I left the sport, I still had a passion for racing. And I'd always been a gearhead in the back of my mind. I love fast cars. You know, I had some sports cars back in the day. And so I had done like one or two track days and someone was like, yeah, dude, you should go to Skip Barber and, you know, and learn how to race cars and maybe get your license. And I was like, Ooh, that's a good idea. I didn't know you could really do that. And so I kind of found Skip Barber and, and went to the school and went through the whole thing. Long story short, I was actually better at racing cars than I was at racing bikes. And that was 20 years ago. So just a weird, random story that you really, you couldn't script if you wanted to, like you put it in a movie and no one would believe it. Those Skippy school Miatas, they really got you going, huh? Those oh no, it was even worse. I, I had the Skippy open wheelers, which are like the worst car. Like everybody's like, the, one of the questions I get is like, what are the best cars you've ever driven? What's the worst car? The worst car by far is the Skip Barber open wheel cars. Those cars are like 50 years old and they've been wrecked and rebuilt and wrecked and rebuilt. Weird aside, I, my two best friends decided to go to Skip Barber. This is a few years after I turned pro and I knew all the instructors there and they were like, hey, do you want to jump in a you know Skippy car and your friends chase you around and do that? I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll just jump in. And my first thought was, man, these cars were crap. And I'm like, ah, I, was just, I was probably not like a good driver back then. Like, it'll be so much better. And I jumped in the Skippy car and like two corners into Laguna Seca. I'm like, nope, these are the <laughs> crappiest cars I've ever driven. And that has not changed no matter what my skill level is. So. <laughs> Yeah. Good old formula neons, right? <laughs> we'll oh, yeah. call them that. Yeah, there you go. How influential were your parents in your career and how supportive were they where you said, okay, I'm going to switch from trying to be a pro cyclist to, hey, I'm going to be a pro driver? How influential? Probably not at all. My parents look at cars as disposable objects. It's a depreciating asset. You buy it, you beat the crap out of it, and then you sell it off in 10 years and you buy another one. You know, they weren't this inspiration I could look to. But as far as supportive, I mean, that's the one thing that I always say about my parents, and this is within motorsports and cycling and school and, and everything. 
is that the biggest thing they ever gave me was the ability to fail. And what I mean is that I always had their support. My dad was always like, if you give 100% and you fail, I've got your back. If you give 99% and you fail, you're on your own. Mm. And for me, that one instills this like, I know I always have to bring my A game to everything I do all the time. But the biggest thing is, is that especially growing up, you always knew that your parents had your back and no matter what your choices were, they had your back. Like literally that, that's the only reason I could do, you know, you look at it, I'm a black kid jumping into, in, on the bikes and then jumping into race cars. That's not a normal thing. But the reason I was able to do that is because I knew that if it didn't work out, my parents knew that I put hundred percent in, they got my back. So since we're talking about your childhood and we're talking about your parents, what was the one car poster on your wall as a kid that your parents wanted you to tear down? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, I love Lamborghinis. So I, I had the classic red Lamborghini Countach up on the wall big wing and all. It cracks me up as a kid. I remember I was reading Road and Track magazine and you know I was just really into cars. I still to this day have no idea where I got it from. <laughs> Neither one of my parents are car people. My sisters aren't car people. Like nobody around is car people. And it's just me. And also like really none of my friends were really car people. So I, I still don't know where I got that bug from, but yeah, I'm glad I did. I'm going to remind our listeners that if you're a petrol head of a certain age, the answer to that question is always Lamborghini Countach. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, coming from the cycling world, really curious what bikes you rode, but we'll leave that maybe for another episode because I'm, I'm a big bike guy myself, always into French bikes and things like that. Although I have an affinity for French cars too, but let's not talk about that either. That's a, but, that's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Do you think understanding how grip on the bike works, preparing for cycling and those kinds of races and things like that, did that prepare you for the car? It has nothing to do with the dynamic of the bike. Bikes and cars have nothing to do with each other. Two wheels, four wheels, narrow, skinny tires, all of these things. The biggest thing that I took away from cycling, and there's a lot of it, is all of the mental side of things. First of all, just the mental preparation for any race you're going to, like the mindset you get into. And then on top of that, you're looking at spatial awareness within the pack. I've got 200 guys around me and they're all doing various things and to be able to keep you know, an eye on things and know where people are going to be. All of those things that you don't get in a car, because when you're driving in a car, it's sedate. You're driving to the grocery store, you're, you're driving to your friend's house, you're driving to you know whatever. It's a completely different mindset that you're in. So it's very difficult for a lot of people, especially new guys coming into to car racing, to put themselves in a mindset of aggressively driving a car. Whereas for me, like the mindset was, okay, I'm racing, go. The thing that I got from going back to Skip Barber was the instructors were always amazed at me because they would say, okay, you're doing this and this and this wrong in the corner, go do this differently. And I would go and I would do it differently. Whereas a lot of other people who were kind of like short on mental bandwidth because there's so many new things going on, they would just make the same mistake over and over and usually faster and spin off. And so the instructors were like, you're the, like the one student that we would tell what to do and you would go do it. Now you might not do it perfectly, but you would make the attempt to make the change. And that was because I had that background and experience and I wasn't so overwhelmed with the concept of pushing something to the limit on the track. Where I want to take this question, though, and I think maybe the audience might be thinking it too, going from two wheels to four wheels, as you mentioned, was there a point in which maybe you were an impasse and said, I should go into motorcycles and not cars? Was that ever a thought? Was that ever a consideration? Did you dabble with that at all? Yeah, I drove motorcycles throughout college. That's how I got around. I didn't actually own a car for a large chunk in college. I was I was a motorcycle guy. But the one thing that you realize is that I'm six foot one. You do not have six foot one motorcyclists. And when I was cycling, I was at my lightest. I was 4% body fat. I was super fit, super light. And I was still 170 pounds. And the guys who are racing motorcycles are not my size. And honestly, the weird dynamic of me getting into car racing is, is that there's always this popular misconception that drivers are tiny little guys. That's true if you're in the formula cars, any open wheel car, usually bigger drivers don't usually make it. You know, you look at maybe Mark Weber or somebody like that as, as an exception, even 
a couple of Formula One drivers currently going that are bigger guys that in the in the six foot range, but they're also 150 pounds, 160 pounds. And I just could never get down to that weight. That's also what steered me out of getting into Formula cars was I did some Formula BMW stuff. And I just remember getting out of the car the first time and it's like everything hurt because I was just wedged up against the car all all over the place. And every time you you hit a curb, it just like literally like the shock of the curb would go straight through to your body. And I was like, yeah, this isn't for me. And then someone was like, hey, why don't you drive a touring car? Why don't you drive a GT car? And it was like, oh, I've got all this room and space. And it's, <laughs> yeah, this is great. I could do this all day long. So before I ask you about honing racecraft and things like that, and I want to ask you one more question about your coming up in the mm-hmm. transition from cycling to cars. Was there or is there still someone in the motorsports community that you looked up to, maybe a hero or, or an idol that you were like, I want to be like that person that inspired you to help make that transition? Yeah, Dan Gurney. The funny thing is, is that I gravitated to Dan originally because I discovered that he was six foot two. I actually think six foot three. Like he's Dan is a very, very tall guy. Going back to what we said, I never thought tall guys could be race car drivers. And so when I found out, I was like, oh, so you can be tall and a race car driver. And then after I kind of zeroed in on him because of his height, I then saw all the things he was doing. He went over and raced Le Mans and he did all of these brilliant things to me that I was like, that's my type of driver. Like he wants to drive everything. Like he just loves driving. And that's for me, kind of what I saw in him as a weird aside, Dan is a legend. And any who doesn't know who Dan Gurney is, go look him up. I mean, the reason that we spray champagne on a podium now is because Dan Gurney sprayed champagne on the podium when they won Le Mans. And that's the level of guy. Like that's the guy that you just look at in the sport and you go, they will be talking about him for the next hundred years because he's that much of a legend. So I went into British touring car and I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point, but I was the first, actually the first American in 40 years to race in British touring car. And the American who raced in British touring car before I did was Dan Gurney. So when I went into British touring car, all of the media was talking about, ah, it's first American since Dan Gurney. And I was tickled pink because, you know, here it is like I'm I'm being mentioned in the same sentence of a guy who I grew up admiring. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Circle back probably, what, four or five months after I made my debut, I was at the the 25 Hours of Thunderhill and I was doing an interview just like this one. I mentioned literally just this exact story. And the guy in the middle of the interview goes, well, you know that our PR person is is Dan Gurney's granddaughter. And I said, oh, that's great. You, you've got to introduce me. This is, tell her that, you know, her, your granddad's a hero, a legend. I, I just want him to let him know that there's a guy out there that's thinking of him. And uh, halfway through the race weekend, I hear my name called to the paddock and it's, it's his granddaughter. And she runs over to me and she hands me a cell phone and is, is, she goes, my granddad wants to talk to you. <laughs> Whoa. And, and I literally spent an hour and a half in the middle of the paddock in Thunderhill talking to Dan Gurney. And he just was talking about British touring car and, and all sorts of things. And then I finally got a chance to go out to meet him. And, and so it was just this great kind of like coming full circle for me. So it was just uh, it's one of my favorite stories. So we talked a little bit already, Rob, about your dad having a big influence on you as far as preparing mentally. But as a racing driver, you have to prepare basically every single day to give your best. How do you do that? And combined with how do you hone your racecraft and how did you hone your racecraft from coming from humble beginnings at Skip Barber to becoming a professional driver? It doesn't happen all the time, right? (laughs) So how did how did that process come about? In terms of the influence of my father and and always being 100% prepared, that is a life thing. I mean, that isn't just, oh, it it happens in cycling or, oh, it happens in motorsport. You know, obviously I run road tech racing. I moved over to Germany where I met you 2013. I lived over there for five years. I founded three companies in Germany, built a home, built a motorsport program. So it's one of those things that I grew up pushing myself. You know, there's my problem is I don't say no often enough, but I also like the challenges that life brings me. And I think that's all part of what my dad instilled at me at an early age, which is always give a hundred percent. And you see the benefits of that every single day. So, Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, that's my dad's influence. But as far as the racecraft thing, 
I think a lot of it comes from going back again to cycling. Cycling may not seem like it to kind of the casual observer, but it's a very strategic sport. And back when I was doing it, I know I'm dating myself, but they didn't have any radios or anything that the cyclists could use. So you literally had to be your kind of own team captain. And you're obviously working with six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 other teammates. So you all had to communicate and you all had to learn how to read a race but you had to read it, not just sitting at your couch and looking at it going, oh, that guy's doing that guy. You were 150 beats per minute heart rate. You've been riding for a hundred miles and you, you still had to make split second decisions on the fly. And I think that that translated kind of into the motorsport thing where you just, no matter how much you're exerting yourself, you really have to just be able to make good decisions time after time, after time, after time. So Rob, you talked about in joking and in jest that the margin of error that your dad put upon you was about 1%. That translated into your pro racing career. How do you deal with that kind of pressure? I mean, we all make mistakes all the time. And how do you recover from those mistakes? I mean, when we're on track and doing doing things and we're working with our students and whatever, we're like, nah, there's another lap. We'll get it right next time. You know, we'll we'll continue to work and continue to progress. But when you're in a 25 hour race, like you were talking about, the margins become become so small. You have to be perfect lap after lap after lap on behalf of the entire team because you need consistency across the board. So how do you deal with that? How do you manage that? How do you manage the stress? And how do you recover from even the slightest of errors? First of all, I don't stress. Like that's, I think a big thing is, is that I learned very early on that stressing is useless. Like it doesn't bring anything. And in fact, it exacerbates all of the bad things. So when you look at it in that perspective, basically just have to kind of take yourself out of the whole picture and go, look, at the end of the day, it's a car, it's a track, and you have to go out and just go out and run laps and and just enjoy yourself. Don't sit there and put all of this pressure on you to, to be this certain thing or do this certain thing. And everybody makes mistakes. Like, yeah, sure. My dad said, you know, you got to be a hundred percent, but what he meant wasn't that I couldn't make mistakes. He meant that I had to give a hundred percent in effort. I make mistakes all the time. I mean, I'm hypercritical of myself. I mean, David will tell you, like, I would sit down and look at data and I'm like, "Ah, I screwed up there. I screwed up there. That was terrible. What am I thinking? But it's all positive. Looking at a mistake I made to correct that mistake. So when I go out again, I don't make that mistake. Now I'll, I'll make another mistake, but it won't be that one over and over again. And that to me is the most important thing is don't make the same mistake over and over again. Make the mistake, learn from it and move on. The old adage is the first thing you learn as a race car driver is how to make excuses. David knows I'm really good at that too. (laughs) (laughs) So sometimes it's the car, sometimes it's you, sometimes you have a day that neither one works, right? And we all, we all know that it's part of just being human. It's part of dealing with machines and things like that. But do you often feel sometimes it is more the car than it is you and, or is it a balance between the two? And I think the other question I have is, you were talking about data. Data is extremely important. The more you move up is analyzing the data and and achieving that consistency, right? These two kind of questions go together. What I want to glean from that is I've also learned that, you know, in teaching students, like on, on an amateur level, it's all about the speed comes later. Don't worry about that. Let's teach consistency. I want to be consistent, take the turn the same way. You know, maybe it's the safest line might not be the fastest line, things like that. But what I've personally discovered is that the data is important but I tend to drive more by feel. So which is it, right? There's different schools of thought on that. And I know it's kind of a loaded question, but I, I be- <laughs> they're intertwined. Well, the first part of your question, I think everything's fluid. There are times when the car is just not there and there's times when the driver's not there and there's times when the driver might be there and the car car might be there, but they're not working well together. So you really can't sit there and say it's any one or the other. And this is actually where data very much comes into play. There'll be times, and David even knows from this year, where we've just been off the pace. And it's been very, very frustrating to me because I I feel that, uh, you know, with my level of experience, uh, that we should be running at the front of the field on a fairly consistent basis. And there have been a few times this year where I'm just missing a second. I have no idea where it is. Like I'm out there. I feel the lap is good. Okay. I made a mistake or two here. That's a 10th or to, but I'm like, there's a full second I left out on the track. I don't know where it is. And the thing that's really helpful is then going back and looking at the data. If, if you don't have the data to compare to, you're just lost. You know, you're like, I drove my heart out. So we were at VIR about a month ago 
you know, I was struggling with the pace. We looked in the data, the end of the back straightaway, because I had been in traffic a lot over the, over the course of the practice session, I was breaking substantially earlier for the last corner coming off the straightaway. And there was six, seven tenths of a second right in that corner, because mentally you're focused on the car ahead of you. And there's some other things going on. You're not just aware that you're not at the limit breaking into that corner and boom, there's your seven tenths right there. So it's things like that, where you, if you don't have the data, it's just a very, very frustrating thing. So not only do I think that it's valuable for drivers that are up the ladder and pro level, I honestly think that, you know, I use data for coaching even the most novice driver because it allows them to hopefully mentally get their head around where they can go faster or where they need to go slower. Because a lot of guys jumping in the car for the first time think that going fast means going the fastest you can through the corner and the car's all out of shape and they're hanging on to it. And they're just like, Whoa, that was fast. And you're like, Whoa, dude, you're about to crash and you're five seconds off the base. And people don't get that. So when I can do a data lap for someone and do a reference lap, and then they can look back and go, well, wait a second, how was Rob so fast? They, you know, a lot of guys get in the car when I give a ride along and they're like, that's not a fast lap. And I'm like, look at my lap time compared to your lap time. That was five seconds quicker than your lap time. And we were just cruising and having a conversation. Why? Then you can look at the data and go, oh, well, you tried to break a hundred meters later than I did going into this corner and you barely got the car stopped. And then you were 20 miles an hour slower going through the corner. And then you couldn't get the throttle until well after I did. So that's the reason you were slow. And I think the only way you can really show that to someone is, is in data. Yeah, I agree with you. I think also yeah, I'm sure novices, you do. That's your job. <laughs> that is. <laughs> I, I think too with novices, the breaking point, right? You have somebody new to racing and they're like, I broke at 150. Yeah. I know I broke at 150. And then you check the data. It's like 180. And I like, right. well, when did you break? Well, the minute I saw the 150 sign, they're like, well, that's not 150, right? Right. <laughs> and then to what you said about how they went through the corner, you show them the wheel slip and you say, well, look, this is what your car was doing. I mean, the good drivers do both feel and data, right? Yep. The prodigies probably only do feel, but the prodigies are few and far between. And then they get to a point where they have to look at data. I don't um, think there's anyone that I know out there that has gotten to the pro level that doesn't know how to read data and doesn't use it on a regular basis. I mean, you know, we, we come off track and we're in there, you, me, and Brian are in there for an hour, hour and a half yeah. going over the data, you At know, least. and these are GT4 cars are relatively simple cars when it comes to, you know, all the setup stuff. There's not a lot we can, we can really do to them. If you're in a GT3 car or a prototype, I mean, your data session could be two, three hours easily, you know, looking at the, you know, all the damper pot stuff and, and all the stuff, all the feedback you're getting from, from every sensor on the car. I mean, you're focused on all the engine stuff and optimizing that. It's not something that you and I debrief about, but that is still something that's important to the, the operation of the car. And it's also important in terms of, of getting a lap time. Let's kind of switch gears a little bit because you mentioned very quickly that, you know, you ended up in Germany but you didn't explain how you got to Germany. So, you know, is your story similar to David's in a way or just in a whole different realm? Yeah, no, my life is never simple. It, there's never a direct path. It's, I've always been very opportunistic, you know, something, an opportunity comes along, not be so wedded to what I'm currently doing that I don't go, ooh, that's interesting. I could go do that. The Germany thing came about, I was racing in World Challenge and Touring Car, and we had just finished the Volvo C30 Touring Car program. It was a factory program. And unfortunately, it, the, the demise of it because the C30 was no longer being sold in the US. And so I was out of a job, kind of like, okay, you know, what do I do now? And you know, I started looking around at other opportunities and that's kind of when the, the British touring car thing came about. But at the same point in time, two of my best friends, I had taken one of, one of them was getting married and we took him to Germany in the Nürburgring, part of the, the bachelor party. We, they're also very much gearheads. Did the Nürburgring, we were going to do Le Mans, we did Spa, it was just a whole thing. It was fantastic. But when we got back, one of my friends was like, well, hey, is there any business thing that we could do over there? It'd be great to do some investment over at the Nürburgring and, you know, have some opportunity to spend some more time there. Uh, and I said, sure, you know, you know, let's take a look around and, and see what's out there. And I happened to literally like the day I started looking, a workshop and a house came up that was in Moispath, which is basically where the industrial center for all of the manufacturers that are at the, the Nürburgring. So if you ever see any of the spy photos of the, you know, camouflage cars that lap the Nürburgring, all of those cars are based in the industrial center right there. And the first building that ever got built in that center is one Gottlieb Dama Strava Drive. So it's literally the first building there came up for sale. Unfortunately, the guy had passed away and his, his widow wasn't interested in doing anything anymore. And she put it up for sale. 
nothing ever comes up for sale in the <laughs> industrial right. center. Like <laughs> it just doesn't. And it popped up and I caught to my friend and he's like, that sounds good. Let's go buy that and figure out what we're going to do later on. We ended up buying it with the goal of being the English speaking base at the Nürburgring for American drivers and for British drivers that were coming over that wanted to race over there, but didn't speak German, didn't know the ins and outs of everything. We had a 10,000 square foot workshop, which the guy uh, who owned it prior had passed away, had it literally equipped like your, your dream garage. Like there was every single tool imaginable, lazed and all sorts of just literally everything that you wanted. And we bought all of that equipment with the house. So we had every tool imaginable. The garage was immaculate. It was, you could literally eat off of it, but the house, they had built this and then they really never got much past the, like generally putting drywall up. And then it was just this absolute mess. And it's actually two small houses that are right next to each other. So I had to go over there and literally we gutted both of the houses. We created a, a single entry. We did this whole thing with the thought process of building, like it's the best way to put it is like a ski house. You know, if you ever go skiing with a bunch of friends, this was a ski house for the Nürburgring. So it's like a nine bedroom house that could house not only the drivers, but also the crew mainly focused on 24 hour race. And where we were was literally a kilometer and a half, maybe two kilometers away from the entrance for the Nürburgring. So a, mile, a little over a mile. It's the perfect base because we're, you know, we can go testing there. We can do all of the tourist sessions. We could coach through there. But for the 24 hour race, it was spectacular because as the driver, you get out of the car and we had a chauffeur, a chauffeur, a driver that would take you in our team car back to the house. And so you get out of your stint and then literally 10 minutes later, you're back at the house with a shower and a warm dinner and a bed. And it's not a normal endurance race where you're sleeping in the back of a truck for, for 12 hours. Yeah. So lucky it, you. It, yeah. It ended in the up, back of a truck several times. Exactly. <laughs> so no, it literally is. It's the way you want to do uh, endurance racing. So it, it, it was just the, the right place at the right time and just a phenomenal experience to be over there for five years and to start several companies, do the racing program and basically become part of of German culture. Not so much like David, who actually speaks German. I never actually got around to learning it very well. So, but still living there day in, day out was, was absolutely epic. Well, I beg to differ because once you become part of the like Nürburgring lore, you're definitely part of the German culture. Fair and enough. I'm part of the German culture. I just don't speak the language. You just don't speak the language. It happens. It's happened. There's a, there's a bunch of uh, people from, from Norway and, and Sweden who, who are the same way. Speaking of that, so what were some of the cultural challenges in racing in Germany and in England that you went through, or were there any? You know, it's really funny. I, I went in there with this thought process that it was going to be this big thing, going to struggle and with everybody, and it was just going to be like this constant battle it was a little bit at when you first get into it because it's just the racing is different the way they run things the rules are all fairly the same but the way they run things and how they do things is definitely a bit different and germans when you get on their bad side they could be a bit intense so like the first couple of things you're just like oh geez this guy hates me and i'm, I'm an idiot and whatever but you do it long enough and you and you realize that no that's just kind of the way they are once you break through it it all goes away and it becomes so so much easier like i said that was the reason we were over there because it's not just having the base for American drivers from the standpoint of trying to find teams to drive for whatever. It's more about saying, hey, look, here are the differences in racing in Germany and racing in the UK than you experience in the US. As far as being accepted, like honestly, like to this day, I'm, I look back on doing British Touring Car and it was just epic. The fans were just, they're the best fans. They literally embraced me right away. Actually, the Scottish fans, I'm huge in Scotland. Don't ask me why, but like I go up to Scotland and everyone's like, Rob, 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 Rob. And it's just this whole thing. And actually, I also can't understand anything that anyone says in Scottish. Everybody needs subtitles in Scotland. They, like, I know you're speaking English, but I, <laughs> I, I, no, I just, I don't know. So I really miss that. They did such a great job in taking me in. So I, I miss that. They put that trill in your name. It's like, Rob, yeah. right? They got to like, <laughs> oh, you got to drag it, it out. It is, it's way beyond that. Like I, I, I did this thing. I like to try when I go to, to various places, I like to go in and, and talk to the kids and, and try to be inspiring and whatever. And I did this thing with the Scottish Cub Scouts, basically. And I went in there and <laughs> there's like 30 kids all trying to talk to me with a Scottish accent. And it just was the funniest thing. Cause every kid, I was like, well, sorry, what again? What was that again? 
can you one more time? No. In, in no. English, please. Can you yeah. can you can you translate? And so all <laughs> the, the the older guys would have to like translate, and they'd have to enunciate everything. And it was just really good fun. And for me, that was a big surprise because I always figured I was coming in as the big bad American. You know, I was the easy target. Everybody like from Europe is like, oh, America, America, America. It, it was the opposite. They really were just so excited that someone from America really thought enough about their series that they would come over and do it, which I laughed at because I think British Touring Car is one of the best series of racing anywhere in the world. They were honored that I would come and want to race it. So that was very cool. I got to ask a question from a professional perspective, because it sounds like you've driven pretty much everything under the sun. I mean, Rotec, famous for their Audis. Now you're in a Mustang right now. You talked about the C30, which not sure if that was some fake me out rear wheel drive concoction or if it was the all wheel drive C30 or the front wheel drive, but I'm sure you've been in everything. So let's kind of settle the debate from your perspective. What's (laughs) the most fun you've had, you know, behind the wheel? Was it a front wheel drive? Was it a rear wheel drive, mid engine? What do you prefer? bit of hubris here. I'm going with front wheel drive, the big, 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 big caveat to, to this. So everybody always complains about front wheel drive cars understeering. They're not wrong. I mean, when you're getting into a corner and you're trying to use the front tires to not only grip through the corner, but also accelerate off the corner, tires can only do so much. So obviously when you start to accelerate, you're going to, at some point in time, exceed the limit of grip that the tire has, and the car is going to want to understeer. Uh, but I have to correct you. I like to call that unplanned track out. Okay. I just want to- <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> well, here's the thing is that, you know, you're going to have an unplanned track out plan for it. And what you do is, is that you set up the car to rotate on entry. Everybody always looks at the, the like I said, understeering front wheel drive cars, but if you can get the car to rotate on entry, then you actually use the throttle to save the car from spinning. It's the most counterintuitive thing, but I call it pitch and catch. You pitch the car into the corner, the car starts to rotate, and then you use the throttle and you basically time the throttle so that you catch the rotation at the apex so that your wheels are straight. And then there is no understeer because all the wheel, front wheels are doing is driving the car forward. It's an art. Like as a front wheel drive driver, you have to do it. It's, it's honestly, I, I look at it as the reverse of driving a Porsche. <laughs> I'm hitting all the marks apparently. So. Oh, <laughs> a- amen. All I'm going to say is amen. Keep preaching. Keep preaching. But it is, it is that <laughs> same style of how you drive a car. It's like if you look at Porsche drivers, they are really quick in Porsches and there's just no way you're going to catch them because if you don't have that seat time in a Porsche, it's the same way with front wheel drive drivers. It's that same thing. And the funny thing is, is that when you get into a rear wheel drive car and I've gone back and forth, I've driven literally everything, the rear wheel drive car, you can't get the car to rotate on entry because if you do, you have no recourse to basically save the car. Going to throttle is just going to create a spin and then and you're done. Unless you're drifting. So, unless you're drifting. Well, unless get... you're drifting, but drifting isn't necessarily fast and you're burning <laughs> your tires and there's a whole bunch of things that go with it. But the thing is, is that then if you have an understeering rear wheel drive car, it's really difficult to get that to balance out at corner exit. And you're just stuck with an understeery car. So I've had more fun in the front wheel drive Audi TTRS. It was an Audi factory car at the Nürburgring. I look back, this is at the 24 hour race and there's 350,000 people. Quickest lap I had ever done at that time at the Nürburgring. I look back at it and just go, that's the lap. If I stopped racing right there, I'd be happy. See, folks, I've said it once. I've said it a hundred times. Fun wheel drive. You got to experience it for real. (laughs) None of these rental cars. Listen to the man. He knows what he's talking about. (laughs) (laughs) We'll sidebar on that one later. Well, you mentioned the Nürburgring and and actually, I I think there's still footage of you driving around the Nürburgring on YouTube. Some really great footage. So you've done the Nürburgring 24 hour, totally iconic, but you've also done 12 hours of Bathurst and you've done Macau, and you set a record at Pikes Peak. How do you go from the <laughs> Nürburgring to, to go into you know, some of the other iconic, you basically have set the bar. I mean, what, what's missing? Maybe you need to do uh, uh, Monaco. I don't, I don't know. You, you, you're Le hitting on everything. And Le Mans, I have, yes. I have not done Le Mans. Yes, we so, need, we need yeah. to do Le Mans. <laughs> but, yes, yes but exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, um, you, you just, basically- just several million dollars as a sponsor. And that's right. But you hit some iconic races. How, how did that come about? 
it's an opportunity thing. Like I go back to how I ended up in Germany, how I ended up in motorsport. It was an opportunity. And I don't look at things and go, there's a barrier. People would normally go, oh, Bathurst, that's Australia. Wow, that's so far away. And I, there's, that'll never happen. Or Macau. I look to find opportunity where I can, and I just kind of go with it. The Macau deal happened because for a number of reasons. But when I did British Touring Car, I struck up a friendship with Rob Huff. And Rob, at the time, was FIA World Touring Car Champion super, super great guy. And he and I just got along well. And he opened up a lot of doors in British motorsport for me. And one of those was a relationship with some of the race teams over in China. So I basically got connected with the guys who were running the Ford factory program over in China. They had a program that they were trying to develop a TCR car. And so we had this connection through Ford because I had been doing some stuff with the Ford World Touring Car Program. And they were like, hey, can you come over? And the, the first deal was to go and race Thailand in Buriram. And that was the world TCR championships. And that's actually where I met our good buddy, Brian Ma was uh, literally <laughs> on the streets of Thailand. And I got introduced to him. We were having dinner literally on the side of a road in the, in, in the middle of nowhere in Thailand. So quite an epic thing. And so I'd worked with Brian through that weekend. Then the next bit of that deal was that if I helped them out with the development of the car at Thailand, they had another car that I could drive at Macau. And Macau, I'd always wanted to do. I mean, it, it's not as well known over in the US, but over the, anywhere in the world of motorsports, it's one of the most epic tracks. It's, I would say equal to Pikes Peak and the Nürburgring as in terms of, of level of difficulty and, and also kind of almost penalty for getting it wrong. For people who don't know, uh, Macau is basically part of China. It's the Portuguese rule, and it is literally three times the size of Las Vegas. And that's what it is, is it's the Las Vegas of overseas. It's the most hedonistic place in the world. And then they have a motorsport race right through it with streets that are literally narrow enough for one and a half cars to get through. And yeah, it's epic. And the, the crowds and the, the what it is, the casinos basically sponsor all the drivers. I mean, it's the most insane thing that I've, I've ever seen. So, so I got fortunate enough to go do that. And then Rob Huff again had another driver that wanted to go over to go race at Bathurst. So we put a program with Rotec Racing to go over there and race an Audi over there. We had some issues with the car, but that's an Audi problem, not a road tech problem. But yeah, so I you know, got, got a chance to go do that. You know, and then because of that, then now I'm over in Asia. So I got opportunities to go do Singapore. You know, once again, it's just it's just meeting people and you know, obviously being competitive behind the wheel, but but also I think generally engaging with people and not being afraid that okay, I'm in China or I'm in France or I'm in Germany or I'm in wherever, you know, I go and talk to people and shake hands and I like to hear people's stories. So I think that affords me some of the options to go and do some other stuff. So I have to ask, Yas Marina. Yep. Have you driven it? I have not in a race, but I have gone and done. I've driven a couple of Porsches there. Like Coda, I think there's you either love it or you hate it, especially for those of us that have never driven it. Our only opportunity is through virtual racing, right? Like things mm-hmm. that David's doing. So I'm wondering, since you've been there and you've seen it, I'm sure you've seen Coda as well, right? These newer design tracks. Mm-hmm. What do you think of a course like Yas Marina? I struggle with that because I actually like, and I also like to a degree Yas Marina. Like it's, it's a good track. It's got some good flow to it. It's got some good sections to it. You know, I like Bahrain. That's a fun circuit as well. The problem I have with any of the modern tracks is that there is no penalty for getting it wrong. You could get all crossed up, do stupid stuff and end off in the bleachers. And yet you just drive on two corners later and continue on your lap. I'm kind of an old school guy. That's kind of why I like Pikes Peak. Like I I have no interest in dying in a race car, but at the same point in time, I like the fact that you have to be spot on everything you do. And it's an old school, big balls. You can't just go in there and be technical. It's not looking at doing sim racing. And I love sim racing, but there's also that sim racing mentality where there's no penalty for getting it wrong. So let me follow this up with another kind of pit stop question. Taking away the big tracks, the Pikes Peaks and the Nürburgrings and and even Spa, the the legendary tracks, if you had to pick your like top three tracks in the U.S. and top three tracks overseas, what would they be? Well, let's expand that to North America because my favorite track in North America is Mosport. The reason I like Mosport is the same reason I like all these other tracks. Like you get it wrong at Mosport, you're in the wall. Mid Ohio is next. I don't know why. I've always gone fast there. I held the track record there for a number of years. I've qualified on pole there. Like it just has this great rhythm, this great flow that I've always just really, really enjoyed. I like to call it Autocrossers Paradise. 
Yeah, literally. Exactly. I think if you're a good autocrosser, you'll be fast at Mid-Ohio for sure. But then you kind of go to the position three and there's just, there's so many tracks that you could fit in there. You know, I love Sebring. Sebring's such a great, difficult track. It's all the bumps and everything else are super tough. I also have a, a fondness for Laguna Seca. You know, I think we all have a, a fondness for Laguna Seca. I'll go with Sebring as my, really? my last and favorite track in the U.S. It is just so difficult to get right. I, I think if you talk to every driver that's ever driven Sebring for the history of the track, if you ever go, have you ever done a perfect lap at Sebring? A lap where you've gone out and just gone, yep, that was it, left everything on the track? To a person, they would go, nope, never done it. I don't care how many laps you have there. It is just so difficult to get right. It's just a great challenge. So I have to say that's a first on this show because we do always get, you know, the road Atlantas and the Watkins Glens and all those kinds of things. Epic tracks. Great tracks. Right? Line rock, all of them, all of the above, right? Kind of makes me wonder before you answer the European slash Asian question, or you can separate them if you want to, what are your bottom three tracks in North America then? I'm just curious. If you're willing uh, to name names, if you want to keep no, them innocent, no, no, innocent, no. that's okay. There are very few tracks that I hate that I'm like, uh, I really don't want to go there. Oddly enough, Sonoma is actually high on that list. And, and I, it always is a surprise to people. And we and literally, we just won there like what, you know, three yeah, months did. ago, <laughs> you know, we we're on pole, we won and it's not my, but I told the guys going in, I'm like, guys, you know, this is not my favorite track. I've never had good luck here. And you know, the other thing is, it's funny, I, I ran world touring car race that I ran was Sonoma. And I'm like, God, of all tracks you had to put me on is the one track that I don't like. Get, get, why couldn't you do it at Mid-Ohio or something like that? Just for whatever reason, it just is a track that doesn't click with me very well. That's probably it. Lime Rock is funny. Like that was the first track I've ever raced on. It was actually when I was racing bicycles. It should be more fun than it is. I've also just never enjoyed it which is very funny because then you turn around and the two of my favorite tracks over in Europe, the first is Knock Hill, which almost no one in the U.S. knows about. If you've seen my picture on Facebook with the, the two wheels in the air, I'm literally about to put the car on its roof. That was qualifying at Knock Hill. And Knock Hill is the bull ring. Just YouTube British touring car at Knock Hill. It's the most epic action. It's the tightest track. It's got curbing all over the place. You're literally flying the car through the air. You never have two seconds to rest. It is epic. It's my favorite track. Is that part of the family of tracks, the Hatch and Olden Park and Snetterton all belong to, or is it one of the nope, standards? It is the Scottish track. It's okay. um, Gordon Shedden, who's a three-time British Touring Car champion, factory driver. He manages the track up there. I get a big grin every time I go up there. Like literally, it's just the feel of Scotland and everything. I just, it definitely, if not my top of the not big tracks, it's up there. Brands Hatch would have to be the second one of that. Brands is just, it's the same thing. And once again, I, I got to have caveats for both of these because front wheel drive touring cars, that's kind of where I made my bread and butter. I enjoy driving those cars. The GT4 Mustang could be kind of fun, but other than that, like I, I wouldn't want to drive a GT3 car. That's not that type of track. It is a touring car type of track. And the battles that those types of tracks create are, are actually legendary. And I think it's the drivers and the cars, obviously, but I also think that the tracks themselves lead into a lot of those battles. They don't have super long straightaways, so you're always on the brakes. And because you're always on the brakes, you've got cars that are going to try to stuff it up the inside. And because that's what touring car drivers do, we're not afraid of a little contact. So I don't mind pushing someone through a brake zone or just diving a car up on the inside. And that, for me, I, I love it. I'm a happy guy if you can give me all that stuff. That's awesome. So what, one thing before we transition back, with all these places you've been to, you know, fabulous racetracks and, and not so great racetracks and everything in between, is there still something on your bucket list outside of Le Mans that you'd want to race at or try? Just Le Mans. I'd like to have a go at NASCAR to tick the box. You know, I'd love to do one of the road courses in the new gen cars. It, I think it would just be fun and, and kind of see what it's all about. But Le Mans in your head, you have this goal of what you want your career to look like as a race car driver. And, you know, Le Mans has to be at the top of everyone's box. That is the best of the best battling for 24 hours on an epic circuit through the French countryside. For me, it is literally the one. I got to say, Rob, you had me at Pikes Peak. And the reason is, <laughs> oddly enough, I find myself as one of the few people in our organization that actually appreciate World Rally. And now I'm dating myself. I grew up in the group B era. So we got mm -hmm. the flaming dragons of the Audis and the Lanchas and the Renaults and, and everybody yep. down the line. I remember countless times turning my father and saying, I want to be a rally driver. And I mm -hmm. still to this day want to be a rally driver. But it's one of those things that in North America is hard to do. 
except for the peak. Let's talk about the peak a little bit and let's talk about your experience there and let's kind of set the time frame. Was this before it was fully paved and you could still run the race to the sky mostly on dirt or is this post paving? Unfortunately, it was post paving. I shared your dream. Growing up, I got basically two forms of racing. British touring car. I don't remember like CBS Sports, I think had some super touring car era racing on it. I just, I was captivated by it. But then actually the, the Group B rally stuff, those guys were epic. And you just look at that and you're just, you're I'm still to this day, when you look at the old videos, you're just blown away by it. So I had this same passion for rally driving, but for whatever reason, my skill set doesn't quite overlap with the rally. I've, I've got great car control. It's just commitment to memory of circuits that you've only seen once. I never thought I could be good in that. Now, I've never really tried it, so who knows, but it, it just didn't seem to be me. When I came to school in Colorado, Pikes Peak Hill Climb was going on and a bunch of gearhead friends of mine. So we went down one year when it was still dirt and it was epic and it was fun. You come back covered in dust and just be like feeling like crap, but it was an epic day. Like, I mean, to see the cars go up the hill, it was just, it was mental. And this is before, you know, even long before I even inkling of a thought that I could be a race car driver. So this was me just being in awe of these guys driving up the hill as the pure spectator. As I turn pro, there's always in the back of your head that like, oh, I now have a skill set that I could probably go do Pike's Peak. And I'd always go, it's dirt. And that's a really long drop off. I'm like, that's not the place to figure out if you've got the skills or not. So no. So that went on for years. And then I remember reading that they were really looking to pave it. And honestly, I felt really bad because to me, Pikes Peak always was the unpaved road. It was Walter Rawl and the Audi guys and the Peugeot guys just ripping it up the hill at insane rates of speed on the dirt. And with those drop offs and the views and everything, it was was, that was to me Pikes Peak. But when they finished paving it, I said, well, wait a second. You've now put that into my domain. I can do this. I made an attempt at it at 2012, I want to say. And unfortunately, there was massive fires in Colorado Springs that year. They had to push the race back to later in the year. And unfortunately, the date they picked coincided with my British Touring Car debut. I had to take the British Touring Car over Pikes Peak. But I had done testing on the mountain. They have two test weekends prior to the race itself. So I got out there. I was able to get on the mountain. Literally, like this first run, I'm like, oh, yeah we're doing this. This is, I get it. I'm all over it. Once I came back from Europe, we've done it every year since we brought over the same Audi TTRS that we had raced at the Nürburgring. And we came out with the intent of breaking the front wheel drive record. The only problem is that we didn't have the time to convert the car from an endurance race car to a Pikes Peak car. And we also didn't really know what we needed to do to do that because we'd never really gone and done the engineering side of things on Pikes Peak. So we just basically ran the endurance race car. And overall, it was pretty good. It was just geared for the Nürburgring, which is you're geared for 170, 180 miles an hour. And that uh, clearly doesn't happen on Pikes Peak. So we were geared wrong and that was a bit of an issue. We didn't quite get the tires right because the surfaces changed so much up there. But even with all of that stuff, we still managed to break the front wheel drive record by over a minute us doing that and then the publicity behind that, it started putting a target on that particular record. And so Acura fired up a program and I think two or three years later, they managed to beat my record by six seconds. And I'm trying to get that back again because it's my record. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but epic, epic, epic race, epic race. It's so unlike everything else that we do. I mean, even when you go to Macau, you're in the middle of Macau and Vegas and it's showgirls and it's this and it's narrow streets and it's all this crazy stuff and people speaking Macanese and all these things. It still doesn't compare to a day at Pikes Peak at all. Pikes Peak just is so epically different from every other form of motorsport. To your point, the fans of all these different motorsports are drastically different too. And I mean, you mentioned earlier about, you know, being in England and and visiting the kids and all this kind of stuff. Traveling the world like this, what have you learned from the fans of motorsport? It's the most amazing thing. I mean, and I, I, the very few people I think that can get this perspective. I mean, you, you kind of go back to racing in America, racing up in Canada, racing in the UK, in Germany, in Macau, in Thailand, all of these things. And you have huge spectator counts at all of these events. And the one thing is, is that they're all gearheads, every single one of them. And that's a universal thing. It's not like this universal language. I mean, that's kind of a silly comment to make. We still have a language barrier in communication, but someone's passion for cars is transcendent to who they are as people. The same feeling that I have about cars is the same feeling that the guys in Thailand have about cars. I remember 
we were at Spa Frankershaps one year. There's a, a little bed and breakfast, really, really great up in Stavolo, like, you know, about five kilometers up the road from the track. And they have a big outdoor, to, you sit down and you order food and everybody, but everyone shares this table. It's literally like the UN, it's French and it's, it's Flemish and it's this and it's that and this other. A couple bottles of wine in an hour later, all everybody's talking about is cars. That is just the conversation. It's this great feeling that you know that the passion that you have for cars is universal. So you picked basically to do two things, cycling and motorsports, where to be quite blunt, there's not a lot of African-Americans. And did you find more or less African-Americans participating in cycling or motorsports? Oh, motorsport for sure. Grew up in Europe, but then I came back to the U.S. and was living up outside of New York City. We used to do training rides out there Saturdays and Sundays and, and all the local races and stuff. There wasn't like a massive amount of black riders, but mm -hmm. there were more than a handful, far more than a handful. And a lot of the guys that mentored me coming up were black. But it was great, though, because back then, you know, I'm dating myself, we were the weirdo cyclists. We were the guys wearing spandex. And this is Greg Lamont time, not Lance Armstrong time when everybody was riding bikes. This was before all that. So we were this weird group of guys. And I was a black guy in a weird group of guys, which is even weirder. The thing is, is that we all realized that we were all this just left of center group. And so that all just bonds you together. I never really had any issues being one of a few black riders. And that just, it just never was the thing. And then you go into motorsport and there's nobody, you know, on the pro level, there's a half a dozen guys in the world that are racing at the pro level, a few more at the amateur level. And I'm starting to see more and more diversity within the paddock, which is really great to see. And obviously that's, you know, one of the reasons our program is, is there is to increase that diversity. The thing I find about motorsports is that it seems a lot of people that are involved are there for legacy reasons, meaning that their uncle raced or their father raced and their father raced and it's a family thing. And that brings in other people that, you know, maybe their friends or, or cousins or whatever. But obviously that group of people is all homogenous and it doesn't really look outside of that group. And, you know, whether it's their job to do it or not is, is kind of irrelevant. It's just that that's what has happened over years and years and years in the sport is, is that it all just tends to be homogenous because of the people that are attracted to the sport through their relationships. Going to a question that you really didn't ask, but our goal obviously is to be that foothold within motorsports and going, hey guys, we're here. Come, you know, the door's open. There's nothing stopping you. There's everybody here is great and they're all friendly. And you might not have seen the chance to have an opportunity to come here, but I'm telling you, it's it's there. So come on in. You know, exactly. This is what this platform is for, for you to, to talk about what you're doing to preserve your legacy, what you're doing to, to be inclusive. And going back, when you first started as one of the few and maybe only well-recognized African-Americans in the sport, did you ever feel that pressure when you used to meet, you know, young men and women who were like, hey, man, I can't believe you're a driver. Like, wow, that's awesome. Thanks for being out there for us. Like, did you ever feel pressure? No, I, you know, honestly, I never did. I mean, I, I, it's funny. I've kind of had this mea culpa. This is actually one of the genesis of our program. When I came into the sport, I came in not as a black driver. I came in as a guy who wanted to beat everybody else, not be the best black driver, but be the best driver. That's just what it motivates me. But also I knew that, okay, I'm the only black driver there. And my thought process was, well, if I can be the only black driver there and I can win races, if that is motivating to someone, then great. I, I'll be that guy. I'll be that role model or whatever you want to call it. And I thought that that would be enough. I thought that me just showing up and winning races and being black and people would see that would be inspirational enough. I've realized after a very long period of time that that isn't enough because motorsport hasn't become more diverse on my watch. And I realized that it's not enough to just go, well, I'm here, so be inspired. Like that doesn't work. You know, the thought process is, is that I now need to make an effort, reach out to people and go, I am here. Come on, let's walk through this door together. I'll show you all these things that I've learned and I'll show you how to walk through that door. And I'll show you that, you know, you might not have even known the door existed. I'm going to show you that the door exists, but I'm also going to hold it open for you. And I'm going to point you in the right direction. And, and hopefully we can use that to get enough people into the paddock. And the way I look at it is diversity is going to breed diversity. If there's people that look like me and I can go, oh, he did it. I see that and I can now talk to him. I can understand his journey is similar to my journey or it's completely different, but he still did it and he did it his way. I can do it and I can do it my way. And that is, I think, the overall goal of what we're looking to try to accomplish here. 
this conversation about diversity is, is super important because we've talked about on this show before the inclusivity of, of women in motorsport and other cultures in motorsport. So we're seeing it kind of across the board. It's almost systemic. We've also talked about, and part of our premise as an organization is the proliferation of motorsports enthusiasm across multiple disciplines. And so what you're talking about is awesome, right? Be bringing people into the sport and being that shepherd and bringing them into touring car, bringing them into TCR or whatever it might be. I also think we have to make a concerted effort to start at the lower ranks, at the grassroots motorsports, in karting, in motorcycles, in all of them, because they funnel up to each other. Even I can't walk in the door and say, I'm here, BMW, I want to run a Formula BMW or a Formula 3. It's not going to happen. Like you have to work your way up. You have to do your time in the trenches. So I think we need to walk in arm in arm somehow and figure out a way or devise a plan to make things more diverse across the board. And then to your point, it will happen naturally. So I'm wondering, how do we do that? Well, like, what's the plan? What, what's your vision of, of how we make all this work? The first thing, and, you know, David will tell you, this is my philosophy, is, is that the tough part about motorsports is it's expensive. Let's just be blunt. It's not a cheap sport. And, you know, obviously, as, you know, the unfortunate facts are, minorities don't have the level of disposable income that a lot of other people do. So when you getting into motorsport, the first thing people talk about is, is the driver side of things. And of course, because that's the most visible side, I'm looking at it going, okay, look, I can go start a program and get my sponsors on board and go, hey guys, I want a program that I want to help fund a young black driver, a young female driver, or whatever it is coming up to start increasing more the diversity in the sport. But the problem is, is that as soon as that funding stops, that driver disappears. They're, they're not there anymore. That then doesn't, end up creating any sort of legacy platform for more and more people to come into the paddock. What I had to look at it is, well, how do you go and do that? How do you create this self-sustaining diversity in the paddock? And the only way to do that is to basically get Black engineers, Black mechanics, Black PR people, Black officials, Black people who are getting paid to be there, that whether or not it's their full-time job, that it is still a job. They can then make a living at it, which means that they can be sustainable within the paddock. That is, for me, the only way I really see the, the possibility of getting sustainable diversity. The thing is, is that, and David will tell you this, is that we've been searching around for people at the top level in motorsport that are diverse all across the gamut. You know, I don't want to say just black, it's Hispanic, it's black, it's women, Asian. I just want to see some diversity within the paddock. And we've looked very, very hard. And literally our team has got the best of the best when it comes to the guys in looking for diversity in their positions. So now we've got to take a look at going down to the grassroots level and creating a pool of people that we can then draw from to help draw them up to, to the top level of motorsports. And that's kind of what, what David's project is, is to start getting kids that are more interested and in, in getting them interested in STEM, getting them interested in motorsports and going, hey guys, there's jobs here. The way I, I look at it is, is that for kids that are potentially excited about getting involved, whether even on the driver level, I mean, I know a lot of drivers that also work as engineers or mechanics or whatever to, to support their driving and still stay relevant within motorsport. What I say is, is that if you go into motorsport, you look at like, say on a mechanic side of things, okay, maybe you can't get on with the teams at the highest level if you don't have the skill set or whatever, but you now have a skill. You are now a mechanic. You look at all of the major automotive manufacturers and they are begging for mechanics to come in. Mechanics are making six figures a year right now. You can go to a, a, a young kid that maybe is a little disadvantaged and go, look, you can learn how to be a mechanic. You know, you're probably working on your own car already. Go to school, go to UTI, be a mechanic. Go in and then have the opportunities in motorsport, wrench on your friends' cars, honestly, show up to the paddock and go, hey, I'm a mechanic. Does anyone need some help? And I guarantee you there'll be a dozen people there going, yep, sure, come and wrench on my car because I can't do it by myself. And that, I think, hopefully will start feeding that motorsport ladder. And you're right. And I, and I also think that folks sometimes they maybe don't know where to do the research to get in. And I think there are some motorsports that are cheaper than others. They all become expensive after a while. <laughs> Let's be real. And you're right. But if you start in drag racing's inexpensive, even if you just run, I hate to say a shit box and you get used to the discipline itself. That's mm -hmm. the important part. I said it before. It doesn't matter what you bring to the track, bring something and learn the discipline. So drag racing is cheap. Autocross is cheap. Karting is cheap in the beginning. until so you want to go to shifter carts and all this crazy stuff. But 
people often forget about one of the oldest institutions in North America that helps foster young drivers, and that's the SECA. And so I want to bring them up and and not to take any light away from what David's doing, because his program is right on point to help us get folks into those positions. We talked about Formula SAE on his show and things like that. But SCCA has a program for pretty much every discipline and you can work your way up. I mean, I remember sitting down and talking to like Andy Pilgrim and he says, I started off autocrossing a GTI. And you're like, your mind is blown. It's like your team Cadillac captain. It's like, how the heck did that happen? You know, but it's because he started with an organization. Like Randy that Pope, that same thing. Exactly. That they help bring these people up through the ranks. And so if you're interested and you're listening to this and you're a younger driver and you're enthusiastic about cars, I urge you to take a look at the SCCA programs because they have something for everybody across the entirety of the U S and it's a great way to get in cheap and then build yourself up. And then maybe there's a scout out there. There's somebody's looking, you're the right day at the right time. You're competing on a pro am level and that's your gateway into something else. And SCCA does continue to grow their programs to get people into organizations like yours where they're running touring car, you know, on the European scene and things like that. So again, a good jumping off block, but switching back to David, who I think has some follow-on questions. Do you have any plans of running a team like Penske or Ganassi, what are your future plans? Funny, I, I used to get asked all this time, you know, Rob, what's your what's your five year plan? What's your ten year plan? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. It, it, it goes back to how I got into car racing in the first place. Like it, you kind of just kind of go with the flow. Like I'm right now, the focus is is road tech racing in this program. You know, obviously we're we're talking to a number of manufacturers to see what we can do for the coming years, and hopefully being involved with a manufacturer, you know, opens some doors to go do other things. And sure, if I could obviously get to the level of pen. That's a great thing. And to be able to be successful as a, as a team owner would be, you know, maybe not quite as satisfying as a driver, but it would still be satisfying. And, you know, it would also give me the opportunity to help increase the diversity directly by just saying, look, we're going to hire minorities and this is how we're going to go do it. That to me is, is hugely important. To be honest, I, I don't really know what the future holds. Right now, I'm, I'm really just really happy with the way Rotec is running and the impact that I think we've made so far and the potential impact we can make for the future. So I got to ask, where did the name come from and what does it mean? Yeah, very funny story. It's a lawyer story, actually. Going over to Europe, we're coming up. And so my partner's Roland Pritzker and uh, obviously I'm Rob Holland and we were talking about names back and forth. And so we would throw like a pool of names at the attorneys and they would go scour everything all over the world and say, okay, you know, yeah, you could use this or no, you can't. And basically everything was coming back. No, you can't use it. It's too similar to this. And there's a conflict in this and that and the other. And this went on for two, three weeks. And we're just like, guys, come on. And what it turned out, it was just lawyers being lawyers. They're being like oversensitive and overcautious. So finally, Roland and I were just like, okay, it's Rob and Roland. So Ro and Tech, T-E-K, kind of a German sounding thing. Ro Tech, boom, done. And we're like, the lawyers are like, ah, oh, but it sounds like it. We're like, nope. Rotec. <laughs> and so we're Rotec racing and that's kind of what it's been. And it's funny because we ha- we're not really racing at the Nürburgring anymore because we are leasing out our facilities to Miltec Exhaust that are, are they have a base over there now. When I came over here to, to race and to start this program, thinking about trying to come up with another name and figure out something else, I realized that Rotec racing has been involved in everything. I mean, we have, you know, just you know, once again, all the stuff that we've talked about that I've done, Rotec Racing has done that, but plus a whole bunch of other things with a lot of other drivers. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I wanted to take that name and that history behind the name and bring it into the U.S. so that when someone went out and, you know, we're like, oh, it's Rotec is doing a diversity program. And it, I didn't want it to be this like someone going, oh, it's a small mom and pop team. And oh, yeah, great. You know, whatever. I want someone to Google Rotec and go, whoa, they were at Macau. Well, they were at Bathurst. They were at the Nürburgring. They were at British Touring Car. They were okay, these guys are legit. They're one of the best teams in the country and huge international experience. All right, well, let's believe what these guys are trying to do and let's take it seriously. On the auspices of this conversation about diversity and, and everything we've been talking about here brought to mind a documentary that came out during COVID. And I'm sure you guys have both seen it. I want to get your opinions on this because many of us on our side had opinions about the film Uppity, the Willie T. Rib story and that. And I was a big Trans Am fan as much as I was a big Group B fan because you had folks like Willie T. and Lynn St. James and Hurley Haywood and all sorts of, you know, even Hans Stuck and Walter Rohl came over and ran in those Pro-Am races back in the day, you know, Long Beach and, and so on down the line. 
was that an accurate portrayal? Was that not so much? And, and what did you guys think of that story, even having lived through that era as well? It's a difficult question. I mean, I, obviously, like, I, and I don't want to undercut things because there are racist people within motorsports. There are racist people everywhere. So you can't yeah. just, just literally buy percentages. There's going to be racist people in motorsport. And did he probably have to go through a lot of that racism? Absolutely. I, I think there's no doubt about it. I do think some of Willie's issues were self-inflicted. He is not known as the most pleasant person in the world. My singular interaction with him as a child was not particularly <laughs> noteworthy. I struggle and also to some of the narrative. And I, and I know I've been part of the process of, of doing TV shows or, or films and whatever. And I know how sometimes narratives are changed or skewed a little bit to fit what they want to portray the film as. Some of the things that came through, I, I just didn't quite agree with. Like again, racism for sure. Did he have to go through it? Yes. But would Jack Roush blow up his own motor to sabotage Willie's race because he wouldn't support Scott Pruitt in a championship? No. Why would you blow up a $100,000 motor when decreasing your tire pressure by five PSI would probably accomplish the same thing? And you come home with a clean car and a motor. Things like that. I think Willie's motor blew up because it blew up. Motors blow up. That's what happened. So there were a couple of narratives in there that I didn't quite buy into. But overall, I mean, the thing is, is I think that without trying to completely undercut things, I do think that the, the movie made some very important points. And it also, the bigger thing was, is that it made a lot of people in the industry think, you know, here's a guy who was clearly a very talented race car driver who had to battle much harder than his peers to win races. And if all that movie accomplished was to make other people in the industry think about that, then I think it, it was well worth it. Would you say that helped or hurt the legacy that you're trying to build? You know, I, I don't really think it has an impact. Willie's still around and kind of at the periphery of a lot of things. He's, I think he's, he was doing, what is it, SRX series or whatever, just jumped into that. You know, and, and obviously with Uppity, his name is definitely resurfaced. But you know, I don't think it hurt. The thing is, is that it's like publicity, there's no such thing as bad publicity. I think if people are talking about diversity, that means that it's something that's aware. I think that's been the problem in motorsports is that it's just not a conversation. If, you, if you're in a group of the current team owners and racers, 99.9% .9 of them are white. The conversation of diversity is not going to come up, not because people are racist or not because they don't care, but because it's just not something that you think about. It's not something that's present in your mind. Why would you? And I, I don't blame anyone for that. So there's not, I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm not saying anyone's wrong or whatever. I think things like this, Uppity, I think our program, and there's a couple other programs out there. I think the more people are bringing it to the forefront, it's at least in people's mind. What I want to see is, is that, you know, not only through our program, but we can only funnel so many people through our program. What I want to be able to do is make an impression on everybody else in the paddock so that the next time a black guy knocks on the door and says, hey, I'd like to be your engineer or a Hispanic guy or a woman wants to be a mechanic. One of the best mechanics I've ever worked with is in World Touring Car and Pippa, and she was a phenomenal mechanic. And that was the first female mechanic I'd ever worked with. You go, why? There's no barrier to entry to be a mechanic. There's no reason a woman can't be a mechanic just like a guy. It doesn't take massive upper body strength or you know anything else. It, it's just for whatever reason, we've not done a good job in nurturing that in motorsports. It's funny, like when I have conversations about diversity with my white counterparts or, or people I deal with in the industry, people get noticeably guarded because they're afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Say what's on your mind. Say, speak your mind. Right. Because if you're being guarded, then you're not really telling me anything. You're regurgitating stuff that you know that will be palatable. And I'm going, look, I don't get upset about you know having diversity conversations. If someone comes in and says the wrong thing about being black or I don't I don't care. My job here is to educate you. I understand yeah. what your viewpoint is. Let me tell you what my viewpoint is. Maybe because you're now hearing me and talking to me that you'll go, okay, I won't name names, but there are a couple of people within some organizations that I'm dealing with that weren't as open to diversity. And the more they sat down to talk to me, the more they realized that their pushback wasn't necessarily against diversity. It was against a whole bunch of things that they had built up over the years of what they thought that meant. 
Yeah. And then when they realized that it didn't mean that we're like, oh, we got to replace you. And it's just like, no, we're going to open up motorsports to a whole new market. That whole new market brings new fans and new sponsors and potential new media sort of like outlets. Like there's a whole bunch of positives that come with this. It's not going to replace you. It's going to help the sport grow, yeah. hopefully far into the future, because it can't be self-sustaining based on its current audience. I live in the North Atlanta area and I've been here for about a year and done several things. And I've also run into a lot of African-American businessmen, a lot, a lot of men, mostly men. I live 12 minutes from road Atlanta. I live about an hour from Atlanta Motorsports Park. And I've taken several people up to both those locations. And these are people who are lawyers. One guy is a doctor at Emory. And when I took him to both places, he's like, I never knew this existed. He had no clue. He said, I got kids. I can, you know, you can go karting here. I didn't know this. And it's about exposure. And this is a guy who one of his cars is the brand new 850 BMW edition. You know, he just bought yeah, it. So, you know, and so yeah. he's got the money. Right? Clearly has disposable income to come and read and probably has some level of desire to go do it. He's like, wait, I can right. drive at 150 miles an hour with my car on the back stretch at Road Atlanta. Yeah. He, saw, he saw the radical pro program at uh, Atlanta Motorsports Park. He said, I kind of wanted to come do it, but he just didn't know. And these are the people that we're trying to reach. And so we're saying, look, organizations, you got to reach out to these communities and especially these wealthy African-American communities, in my mind, bring them to the paddock, let them experience it. And then they're going to start spending money. Yep. To be quite blunt, if you ask most Black Americans, what is their sport that they feel that they haven't been allowed to do and they, they couldn't do, it, it's between yachting and golf. And so that's like the first, those are the first two things they do when they get well, right. they buy a boat and they go golfing and, the, and motorsports never comes into the conversation because they no. don't ever think about it. No. They all own nice sports cars and all sorts of things. And they all drive fast on the highways and right. don't, and they realize. don't know anything about driving. Yeah. <laughs> No, so that's the thing. So Road Tech Racing and this whole program has come together in partnership with the SRO series, which is the series we race in, which is the X World Challenge series that I just started off in in my pro career. Greg Gill, the president of SRO, has recognized the lack of diversity in a paddock. He's like, look, I can't tell you what the problem is, but if I walk into the middle of the paddock and turn around, I'd see people who look like me. And so he recognizes that lack of diversity. So that's where the genesis of this program came from, is support from guys like Greg Gill. One of the things that we've tried to do, especially just recently at Nashville, and then when we go to Indy, we are doing that, David. Is we are reaching out to the communities there. And the feedback that Indy has gotten, you know, and obviously Roger Penske has just taken over Indy, the track, and the whole entire series. So you have a whole new fresh set of eyes. Now, the Holman family is gone, and the Holman family has run it for, you know, whatever, 100 years. So I think that they kind of got that myopic view of, okay, we're just going to do our thing and keep doing it. And this is, this is fine. When Penske took over, he reached out to the local community and said, hey, you know, guys, why aren't you spending more time at our racetrack? And this is obviously a prominently Black community. And they're like, we didn't think we were invited. Like literally, that's what they got back from the Black community surrounding the Indianapolis 500. Greatest event in motorsport and the community that lives across the street has for a hundred years not felt like they were invited at the Indy. That's something that we have to recognize. And I think then not only us as a program, but all of the series, track owners, whatever, they have to make more concerted effort not to just deal with the status quo. They actually have to go out and say, hey, let's do some outreach. Let's reach out to communities that we would not normally go ahead and talk to and try to get them interested in this. And I think that they can do that. And I think it can be successful. Back when Bentley was in GT3 racing, how many African-Americans own Bentleys? Two. How many of those African Americans <laughs> were ever guests of Bentley at a racing event where yeah. the dealer said, Hey, you're an owner. You know, we're having this event. Why don't you come out? You know, missed opportunity. 100%. Yeah. And I think the big thing is, is that, you know, you look at like, you know, brands like Porsche, you know, Mercedes, they've got a fairly large percentage of black owners. I mean, that's yes. always been, but Mercedes, especially, it's been an aspirational brand in the black community for, for years and years and years. So, why not use the motorsport side of things to, to reach out to that community and get them involved, get them to the races? So I think it's coming. I think in this current climate, I think there's a lot of talk about diversity. A lot of the manufacturers and, and organizations are creating diversity boards so that that is a constant conversation and so that these ideas could be vetted through there and potentially brought out. Behind the scenes, I see a lot of things that are moving. Hopefully that we can kind of help be the genesis to that and create something that not only is sustainable within the paddock, but also creates a whole new fan base. Growing up in motorsport, I never felt like you were saying, I mean, racism exists everywhere. Discrimination exists everywhere. At the racetrack, it always felt like once the helmet went on, 
Mm. Everything became very binary. The flag stations are either on or they're off and cars are objects. And it's not Rob behind the wheel and Dave behind the wheel. It's Mustang and it's Porsche and it's Audi. And it's just, everybody's fighting. You're jockeying for position. Felt like once the flag dropped, a lot of that stuff just kind of disappeared. I guess my track experience is, and I've talked about this before, is very similar to Eric Bana's. Like if you've ever watched Love the Beast, his opening monologue, he talks about, and he's driving it, not at Bathurst, but one of the other tracks at Australia. And he's out there and he's just like, he's in the zone. And he talks about how just everything just disappears. And when you're behind the wheel, it's just, everything's objective. It's just object here, car there, apex there, flag on, flag off. And so I kind of operate the same way. And that was kind of my point of even driving by feel. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of input. There's a lot of sensory going on. But when you're behind the wheel, it almost becomes very primitive. And a lot of those things that you carried with you in the baggage just seem to disappear. Now, granted, mm-hmm. you step back out of the car and reality sets in. I wish it was like that in everything, but I feel like in motorsport unlike a lot of other sports, maybe we are hiding behind the helmet in a sport like basketball or even football or whatever, where you you see the opposition, see who you're up against. It's just, it's very different because you are behind the mask. You are behind the windshield. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I have a false interpretation of it, but. No, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with it. I think the the harder part though, when you're looking at diversity and and women uh, as well in sports, you know, motorsport is kind of the paddock, you know, when you're in the paddock, it's a whole different scene and it's very much a boys club. I've worked with a lot of women in motorsports, both coaching and kind of mentoring to a woman. They've all said the same thing, that it is probably one of the most inhospitable places for women because it's guys being guys, it's testosterone, it's A-type personalities, and that's not a comfortable situation for a lot of women to just drop themselves into because now you put yourself in with a bunch of A-type personalities and then now you're going to go race with them on track. And I think that that just creates this tension and this dynamic that just isn't the most comfortable place. And honestly, when I, you look at minorities in motorsport, you know, one of the other issues is obviously motorsport is, especially on the upper echelon, there are a lot of very, very wealthy, very powerful individuals in motorsport. Powerful in the sense that they've made their money in the business world. They're known CEOs or very high up in, in a lot of companies. If you're looking from a lower middle class perspective, coming in, being of a different color, being not of that same education level, being of not of that same income level. And here you're dealing with the Roger Penske's of the world. I mean, Roger's a great guy, but that level of person, that's a really intimidating thing on a constant basis. If you're walking in dealing with these guys every day, day in, day out, and you're just not prepared for it, I think that's another barrier. So I think there's all these hurdles. And I think that's the difficult part of motorsport. Playing basketball is easy. Playing baseball is easy. It's an easy thing to go do. Motorsport, there are a lot of barriers. And I think that in order to increase participation, you've got to figure out ways to remove them or at least minimize them. So Rob and Dave, we've gone deep. This is good stuff, right? And we're opening different pages of of the book here. And we're really looking at this from different angles. And I think it's great. And I think you've brought to light a lot of really important aspects with respect to motorsports, some things we need to consider as the sport continues to evolve because it's evolving right now, even on the engineering side of the house, as we transition away from petrol into EV, we're seeing, you know, all female teams at the Indy 500, like there's a shift in motorsport right now. And I applaud the early adopters. I applaud the people that embrace this change like yourselves and want to continue to perpetuate motorsports. And again, that's what we're all about here is continuing that motorsports enthusiasm. But I want to leave the audience with kind of two fun ones as we wrap up here, because you've been all over the world. You've been racing for a long time, you know, 20 plus years now. You've been very successful and all that. I got to ask. There's lots of Audis on the website right now. And I'm a, I come from a VAG Porsche family. So I'm wondering, is that your favorite brand or something better on the list? No, I honestly, I loved Audis for forever. I remember back in the day, my dad bought an Audi uh, 5000 and I was really trying to get him to get a Quattro. Like I was like in the dealership, no dad's a Quattro, that's what you really want. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I've just had this love affair with Audi over the years. And so I was very fortunate to connect with them at, in Germany, in the Nürburgring. In fact, my current car is an Audi RS6. So, and it's, it's my favorite car ever. So yeah, I'm, I'm an Audi guy through and through. So yeah, there's nothing else in the garage. 
And I'm glad you understand that Audi was created before the year 2008. So <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm, I'm dating myself again. So yeah, it used to be like nothing existed before the B5 S4. And now it's like, wait, they made cars before 2010. Well, right. all, all kidding aside. <laughs> but one other question, you've been all over the world, lots of tracks, you got your bucket list, but if there was one track that you could drive for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Nürburgring? Because Nürburgring. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like that's it no uh yeah it's, it's the greatest track in the world if you've never been there you have to go you don't understand how epic the track is until you're there i i'd always I tell people that i said when i when i went to the nurburgring the first time you know he, everybody tells you when you go you're like oh it's so cool it's so cool it's so cool you should go you go see so you go there and you get there in the first day you're like why didn't anyone tell me it was this cool it literally takes what you thought you knew about what cool was and blows it out of the water the track is epic all the towns and villages around their epic they all support motorsports it's like a big giant ski area for motorsports mm -hmm. like everything in the region is there to support the track so people love cars in the region because they're in the industry so yeah it's nurburgring now with that being said i'm going to leave one for david you know to follow up with his episode which is if there's any one video game that does the nurburgring justice which one is it hmm you better say iRacing because I, I was involved in the iRacing. <laughs> I was going to say, to be quite honest, iRacing does it the best. People complain about the tire models, but to be honest, iRacing has come a long way and it's really good. And I, I think it does Nürburgring the best. So. And since we were talking about Pikes Peak, they just introduced that Mount Washington is being added. So they are starting to branch into hill climb and maybe rally in the future in iRacing. So that would be pretty mm -hmm. cool. Because no, the iRacing guys are great. I've known them for years and I consulted with them a bit on the Nürburgring. We were there. They had the track to themselves for three days to laser scan it. And so it was uh, awesome. good fun taking those guys around. That's why I'm glad you said Nürburgring because that means I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure to have Rob and Dave on the show and having Dave back on the show here as my co-host. But I want to leave you guys with some parting thoughts. Think about how we can foster the younger generations and get them incorporated into motorsports and continue to perpetuate all this goodness that we have to offer. Not everybody can play stick and ball games. And there are a lot of petrol heads out there that are sitting behind the screen and would love to be on track. And to Dave's point, there's a lot of instances where I didn't realize I could go get out there and explore, partner up with other people, folks like Rob that are willing to show you the way and get into these programs and experience it for yourself. Even something cheap like autocross or kart racing or, what, or drag racing, whatever it might be, get out there and try it. Experience something new and enjoy the wonderful world of motorsports. So for more details on Rob and Rotec Racing, visit www.rotechracing.com or follow them on Facebook and Instagram and follow Rob directly at Rob Holland three. And don't forget to check out the episode we did with David about my and his esports and STEM racing program, as well as checking them out on social media at M I E or my dot racing. So guys, I cannot thank you both enough for coming on the show and talking about all the things we went over. I think it's been an absolute pleasure. And again, I just can't thank you enough. Thanks, yep, for, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember... Without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.